At least $3.4 trillion worth of trade passes through the South China Sea annually, accounting for a third of the global maritime trade. In various parts of the sea, there is promise of crude oil and natural gas beneath the seabed, while other areas hold rich fishing grounds. But the sea is also loaded with distinct hazards and choke points such as straits, reefs, smugglers, secessionists and so on. On top of everything are the political boundaries of the nearby coastal states. No fewer than seven countries have maritime claims in the South China Sea, each overlapping the other. But one state in particular makes the most daring claim. The People's Republic of China not only disputes the waters of each of its neighbors, but in doing so, it seeks to cast its hegemony over the nations bordering the South China Sea. I'm your host Shirvan and welcome to Caspian Report. Special thanks to Santa Barbara Chocolate for sponsoring this episode. As a chocolate connoisseur, they bring high-end brands to the online market at wholesale prices. It's easy and affordable. Some of their best sellers include the smooth 100% pure cocoa chocolate with no added sugar, or the cocoa flavonoid preserved dark chocolate and many others. Visit their site and treat yourself. Use the promo code CASPIANREPORT to get 15% off any item in any category. You'll find the links in the description and the comment section. Unlike other places on Earth, the sea is the primary system for communication and transportation in Southeast Asia. More often than not, the regional hinterlands are beyond the control of the authorities. The sea, therefore, offers the most efficient way to get around and get things done. So securing trade, docking, patrol and military rights through the waterways can mean all the difference in achieving prosperity and stability. Beijing's territorial claims in the South China Sea are based on an ambiguous map from the 1940s known as the Nine Dash Line. The U-shaped demarcation line covers about 90% of the South China Sea and extends as far as 2,000 kilometers from the Chinese mainland. Not surprisingly, the nearby coastal nations disagree with that claim. The dispute was mostly academic until 2013, when China launched a large-scale reclamation program at seven locations in the Spartley Islands. Sitting at the heart of the South China Sea, this is the most hotly contested area as it is also claimed by the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia and even Taiwan, the latter's claims mirror that of China. Policymakers in Beijing claim the Spartley Islands for its rich fishing grounds and substantial quantities of hydrocarbon reserves. There is enough crude oil and natural gas to keep Chinese industries going for decades to come. As such, China went to work and by 2016 it had already reclaimed about 3200 acres of land atop seven reefs in the Spartley Islands that were partially submerged. This led to political hysteria in the region and it was followed by some tough negotiations between Beijing and Washington resulting in the termination of the reclamation program. Still, it didn't stop China from placing military facilities on the already reclaimed territories. Over the years, the Chinese military installed extensive naval, air and missile systems on the seven islands. The exact details are still sketchy, but it is presumed that the islands of Fiery Cross, Mischief and Subi now host sophisticated air defense systems as well as barracks, helipads, runways and hangars capable of hosting dozens of warplanes. In addition, the island of Fiery Cross has a deep water port where large vessels can dock and similar harbors are still under construction at Subi and Mischief. As for the smaller islands, each holds radar facilities, bunkers and supply platforms. Taken together, these islands act as aircraft carriers, projecting power across the periphery. To further cement its claim to the area, China's Coast Guard and maritime militia use non-naval vessels such as container ships and fishing vessels to harass foreign ships under the cloak of plausible deniability. It's a doctrine that makes the neighborhood think twice about entering Chinese claimed waters, but the policy stops short of escalating into an armed conflict. 
That said, China's expanding presence affects peripheral powers as well, including India, Japan and Australia, which are all keen to secure their access to and from the South China Sea. Japan in particular has authentic concerns in the region. As an island nation with little natural resources, Tokyo's lifeline passes through the South China Sea. Thus, it is inevitable that Japan will emerge from its geopolitical sleep and reassert itself once more in Southeast Asia. For Beijing, this is a serious complication, because unlike the globally committed Washington, the Japanese will focus exclusively on their Chinese rivals. About 320 kilometers southeast of Hainan Island is a chain of reefs known as the Paracel Islands. It is disputed by China, Taiwan and Vietnam. Here, Beijing's interests are more obvious since the Paracel Islands form a defensive layer for Hainan Island which hosts the Chinese nuclear submarine fleet. More importantly, whoever controls the Paracel Islands and Hainan Island at the same time will gain the ability to cripple Vietnam by targeting the narrow Annamese range that effectively splits the country in two. For centuries, Vietnam obstructed China's quest for regional hegemony. If Beijing can subjugate Hanoi through control over the Paracel Islands, then China has won the fight. And that seems to be exactly what China is pursuing. Eight of the Paracel Islands have a Chinese presence, with the largest military base being on Woody Island, where about 1400 military personnel operate radar facilities, SAM batteries and an airfield. Moreover, Woody Island serves as China's administrative capital of all the claimed island chains in the South China Sea, acting as an HQ in a geopolitical hotspot. Since 2016, China has sought to normalize its presence on Woody Island by operating daily civilian flights to the island, promoting tourist activities and even holding weddings. By adding a civilian element to the island, Beijing hopes to showcase the territory as an authentic island with an economic life of its own. The goal is to get an exclusive economic zone around Woody Island, but more on this later. Finally, there is the Scarborough Shoal, a triangle-shaped chain of submerged rocks and reefs. Due to its proximity, it was administered by the Philippines until China's forceful takeover in 2012. Since that standoff, the Scarborough Shoal has been a point of contention between Beijing and Manila. Initially, Filipino policymakers expected their American counterparts to defend the territory as was required by the defense treaty between the Philippines and the United States. However, the Obama administration quietly declined to confront China over its occupation of the Scarborough Shoal and chose to protest verbally instead. Imagine if the Russian military violated and occupied some strategic real estate in the Baltics and NATO reacted with only a verbal protest. That's the sort of thing that happened with the Philippines. Understandably, since the turn of events, relations between Manila and Washington deteriorated considerably and the Filipino leadership turned to China to forge a new understanding. China gained all the rights for resource extraction, fishing and signed dozens of agreements promising infrastructure investments in the Philippines. But up to this day, Beijing maintains no military installation on the Scarborough Shoal. The thing is, the chain of reefs is located about 350 kilometers from the Filipino capital. A Chinese military installation on the Scarborough Shoal would threaten Manila and provoke a desperately harsh response by the Philippines, probably even pushing the Philippines back into the arms of America. For China, its presence on the Scarborough Shoal is all about securing access to the Pacific. You see, a series of small islands surrounds the eastern edge of the South China Sea, running from Japan to Indonesia. It is dubbed as the first island chain and to travel across it, Chinese ships must sail through choke points that are vulnerable to interception by land, air or sea. For Chinese military officials, control over the first island chain is a necessity if the country is to have any preemptive options in times of conflict. 
the controversial 9-Dash line is loosely based on the first island chain and thereby illustrates its historical strategic significance. The Philippines is the only state along the island chains that is weak enough to be subjugated or coerced into a political agreement. As such, China uses its presence on the Scarborough Shoal to subtly steer the behavior of the Philippines and secure access to the Pacific. But in all likelihood, the chain of reefs will remain a demilitarized zone for the foreseeable future. Of course, it couldn't be that easy. Despite the informal understanding, the Filipino government brought the Chinese state to the permanent court of arbitration at The Hague in 2016, which provides services to resolve disputes in international treaties between countries. During the tribunal proceedings, the court referred to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea for the definition of an island. According to Article 121 of the Convention, an island is a naturally formed area of land surrounded by water, which is above water at high tide. Moreover, an island must sustain human habitation or economic life. The Chinese lawyers pointed to Woody Island and the 1400 military personnel that inhibit it as proof of human habitation and economic activity. However, the court ruled that the economic and human activities were sustained through continued delivery of supplies from outside. As such, the seven Chinese assets in the Spartley Islands failed to meet the legal requirements of an island. Instead, the territories were deemed either as rocks or low tide elevations. This has profound legal implications because rocks and low tide elevations grant a different set of rights than islands. The most important legal difference is that only an island comes with an exclusive economic zone that extends out for 370 kilometers beyond the territorial and contiguous zone into the sea. Within that area, the state has full control over the economic resources such as fishing, mining and oil exploration, while the freedom of navigation remains in effect. China defies the Hague conclusion and asserts that its holdings in the South China Sea are islands, giving them full 22km territorial sea and a 370km exclusive economic zone. And this is where the United States comes in. For the US Navy, the freedom of navigation, legally known as innocent passage, is tied to America's ability to project power abroad. Nearly 40% of China's total trade passes through the South China Sea, including most of its energy imports. At the flick of a switch, the US Navy can impose its terms on Chinese vessels sailing through the area. Over time, such an imposition would cripple China's economy and trigger social unrest across the country. Evidently, such an act would also hurt the global economy, so it's a deterrence policy that hurts both the attacker and the defender. However, the policy can only work as long as the freedom of navigation remains in effect in the South China Sea. Without the freedom of navigation, American lawmakers would have to rewrite the geopolitical balance with China. Seen in this context, the US Navy upholds its interests by conducting freedom of navigation operations. These are naval maneuvers that set legal precedents and reinforce or challenge maritime claims. The law of the sea defines innocent passage as the transit of a warship from one country through the territorial waters of another, with the condition that the transit vessel refrains from military research, surveillance and survey activities. The transit vessel is also obliged to move continuously and expeditiously through the territorial waters. So what the US Navy has been doing for the last couple of years in the South China Sea is by sailing its vessels in a zigzag pattern through the waters of the Spartley Islands. By sailing in a zigzag formation, rather than continuously and expeditiously as is required in an innocent passage, the Americans make it known that they do not recognize the waters around the Spartley Islands to be an exclusive economic zone belonging to Beijing. Meanwhile, the Chinese Navy reacts by tailing the American vessels, demanding that they leave China's exclusive economic zone, as to set a precedent of their own. This cat and mouse game has been going on for years, but it also reveals the irony of great powers. 
The United States is not a signatory to the law of the sea, but it seeks to enforce the international regulations to everyone else. Simultaneously, China does recognize the treaty, but blatantly violates the rules. It just goes to show in geopolitics, the strong get to bend and break the rules. Some policymakers argue that there is good reason for breaking the norms, because there is a lot riding on the outcome. As the global naval power, America has the ability, if not the intent, to constrain China's growth. It makes sense that Beijing feels exposed and vulnerable, which is why it's expanding its military footprint in the South China Sea. Meanwhile, the United States seeks to restore the status quo as it grows increasingly insecure over China's rising power. However, time is on China's side. As military technology advances and missile capabilities improve, it will become increasingly harder to dislodge the Chinese from the area. In turn, this will allow Beijing to take up new positions to bypass the leverage of the US Navy. Going by this forecast, some American officials argue that it is in Washington's favor to act sooner rather than later. That means applying physical force. Ultimately, this deadly pattern is the tale of a rising power challenging to eclipse the ruling one. China embodies a rising Athens, while America exemplifies a Sparta that seeks to hold it together. A dance known as Thucydides' Trap. The only way to escape this pitfall is for both sides to take a step back and redefine their relationship. Now, if you want to delve even deeper into the power politics between Washington and Beijing, check out Destined for War by Graham Allison. The affiliate link will be in the description. The book covers 500 years of history where great powers sought to overturn one another. All invaluable lessons to understand the geopolitics of the South China Sea. I've been your host Shirvan from Caspian Report. Credit goes to our Patreon community for making original content like this possible. If you want to learn more, see the links below. Thank you for watching and so